So we're going to start this afternoon our first farmer panel, and I wanted to just explain sort of how this was, was going to flow. I gave these guys homework where I asked uh, them to send me some of their, their top tips uh, for managing soil health and profitability. Um, and I do have a last minute change in the schedule. You might notice on your agenda that Brad Ritter is listed, um, but he was unable to make it today because he got the sick. Um, so we're hoping that he feels better. And so uh, Chip Baker here most graciously stepped up in his place. Um, so Chip it, thought he was retired. Um, but I've been looking for an excuse to um, bring him back into the fold and, and make use of his expertise, and I found one. So thank you very much for stepping in. I would say you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to start by letting everybody introduce themselves real quick, and then we're going to roll through these points, and then there should be plenty of time for questions and answers. So uh, I'll start with you, Chip, and we'll go down the line. I'm Chip Baker. I've been retired about a year. I retired after 2018. And uh, I'm happily retired. <laughs> That's it? That's it. All right. I'm Jay Baxter. I'm a, the bio says I'm a fourth generation farmer at Baxter Farms. And I was having a discussion with somebody at lunch. And, you know, we, chase, we trace back our family heritage of, of agriculture and, and some of the land that we're farming back to land grants. So you know, besides just on the Baxter side of the family, you know, we go back on my mom's side or my grandmother's side, you know, many, many generations. And so it's kind of cool to think back uh, in that regard, but we're growing um, typical agronomic crops, corn, soybeans, the occasional wheat when I think the market's right. Uh, sweet corn, llama beans, chickens, and uh, we've recently got into uh, potted plant production in greenhouses, so it's a uh, diversification in my mind is a little bit of the key to keeping us from sleeping. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Fry from Fairhill Farms in Chestertown on the Upper Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, I guess I feel like the odd one out up here and maybe um, like a little out of my class because at, at the end of the day, I usually say I'm a dairyman, not a, not a farmer. Our core business is, is milking cows. Um, and as an offshoot of that, we, we farm ground to support those operations. So I'm just as anxious to hear from everyone else up here as you guys are. And uh, I'm Trey Hill, I'm one of Matt's neighbors, I would say. We're from, both from King County. Um, I own and run Harborview Farms and we're a uh, no-till cover cropped uh, corn, uh, wheat and soybean producer. Okay. So starting with our first one goes to Trey. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Well, I think as a farmer, it's hard to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. You know, if you look back, if you reflect back on your social life, you know, the greatest accomplishments you have in life are often through discomfort. You know, for those that are married, those that first stepped on the sports field, you've always got a nervous anxiety that ends up reflecting back, and that's what you remember. As a farmer, I think we have so much other stress, you know, markets, help, personnel, everything else, that we view that stress as the same, but that's unhealthy stress. So for me, planting green cover crops and kind of changing the way we do things has given me some of that healthy stress in my business life. Um, and I think it's just kind of made farming more fun. It's not tied into economics, it's just tied into quality of life, um, where I just think it, it, it's added a lot of enjoyment to growing corn and soybeans um, probably over the last decade. Um, so to me, that's been very important. So, Chip, this one goes to you. Know what goals you're trying to achieve. Well, when you plant a cover crop, whether it's the next corn, it's going to be a corn crop or a soybean crop, you want to determine what, what kind of cover crop you want to plant. Um, for a corn crop, you want, in our operation the last few years, well, the last six or seven years, I guess, we were, uh, we planted a legume, a grass, and uh, a brassicas. We planted a, uh, and you have to have a reason for wanting to plant this. We planted a um, brassicas to retain the nitrogen or and potash and phosphorus and whatever else for the next corn crop, or for the next yeah for the next corn crop. And uh, one thing, the brassicas will die over winter, and so 
we ended up with uh, cereal rye and uh, um, vetch, hairy vetch. Now, I know a lot of people hate putting corn into uh, rye, but we never had a problem. Uh, we knew the concerns of the allopathy. We've heard that for years, but um, we put a tube of two on both sides of her planter and uh, we had 50 pounds of nitrogen on at planting time and we never had a problem. So um, that's why we use the rye. And what helped the vetch, instead of matting on the ground with just vetch, the uh, vetch would grow up to right up the top of the rye. So it made it a whole lot easier to plant in. Um, far as soybeans, we were pretty much strictly uh, uh, cereal rye. Um, we occasionally tried a legume in it to see if it would help at all with uh, any adding any nitrogen to the soybeans, but um, honestly, I never did see a benefit to that. But you have to have a goal in mind. What are you after? What, what do you want to accomplish with? And that's the three things for corn and the one thing for soybeans. Uh. So Matt. Broaden your crop rotations. So we, we have a very different approach in our operation. Um, and I, I didn't mention this before, we're a certified organic operation, um, both in our dairy and in our cropping. Um, and so for us, we really have to step outside what we've considered our typical agronomic crops, but we also have the ability to utilize more of those crops because we're, because we're milking cows. We also have a beef cow herd. Um, we're, not, we're not in a position where we're just ultimately selling to the poultry industry with number two yellow corn and soybeans. Um, and so we have different avenues to generate revenue out of those crops. But in an organic operation like ourselves, a lot, using a broader range of crops helps us not only with disease resistance, pest resistance, um, diversifies the nutrient profile that we need on those crops. Um, and so that's been a big driver for us um, is and allowing us to continue to have ground that's sustainable. Um, but I'd say cattle have played a big role in that and how we can utilize those different crops. So Trey, back to you, diversify your cover crop mixes. Yeah, I mean, I'd say like most of the folks in the room, we started out with cereals about 20 years ago. And um, I think for beans following cereals, trying to figure out what crops, what cover crops complement our field crops is what was important. And I think what we're learning is that crops that are similar learn to compete with each other. If you look back at the native prairies or a forest, you always have diversity. But the things that compete with one another are the like-minded crops. So we were planting a grass and then trying to plant a grass into it. So as the roots were talking and the fungi were talking, they were telling each other to compete. Now, folks in the room will probably disagree with everything I'm saying, say it doesn't make sense. But what we're finding is that if we can diversify that cropping mix in our cover crops, it's building the diversity in the soil. So we went from just the straight cereal, the straight wheat and rye, then we started adding some clover to offset that carbon to nitrogen ratio. So we're getting things that'll fix nitrogen. So as the crop grows, as the cover crop grows, you get a high carbon to nitrogen ratio in the cereal rye. The clover and the vetch are growing at the same time to offset that high carbon to nitrogen ratio to then give us a release of nitrogen. Um, so the more stuff we're now getting into like some eight, nine, 10 way mixes, and what we're finding is that we're getting flowers all year. We're getting flowers until we plant. So we'll have rapeseed, crimson clover, followed up by vetch. And then we'll add some turnips in, we'll add some different things. Um, and what that's doing is building a lot of diversity in our soil. So we're pulling back on our pesticides, um, using a lot less insecticide, also lowering our uh, rates of herbicides, um, and in doing so saving money, but we're attributing that to that mix. We're not getting the yellowing in our corn. We're not getting some of the things that we were, we, we got called a couple times um, with the cereals, planting into high cereals, we'd have a disease in there that would attack the corn. Um, we'd have nitrogen tie up so the corn would turn yellow, we couldn't get it fixed. Um, once we started using mixes and kind of buffering all that out, um, we're not seeing any adversity to our crops and I think our yields are increasing uh, mainly because of that diversity. So Chip. Get the next generation started early. <laughs> You're talking to a good one on that. <laughs> I'm late. Um, next generation started early. Um, I guess I can start by saying um, my farm is being taken over by, and it took me a little while. I, I had a 
few people that wanted to rent it, but um, I really wanted to, all the work I had done for the last 30 years, I wanted to make sure that somebody didn't come in and till it the first year. So I did find a young person to do that. Um, and uh, what I'm seeing from him is he's gone beyond what I, I could even imagine, but what he has done is brought in his son and he's training him already to, to do that. So uh, I'm very pleased with that, but that's, that's about what I would say about starting young. Hey, I'm gonna get off script. Go ahead. You good All with right. that? Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw Trey under the bus. Okay. All right. Um, first time I heard you speak, you made reference to your son and the questions that he asked you as a very young man, as a seven year old, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Dad, why are we doing this? And share that, would you? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that talking to kids. Um, well, for me, I I, I kind of put my children and the environmental community kind of into the same boat you know it's all folks that have made me very self-aware of everything that we do so when we were out there you know i walk in the fields with my kids you know we'll go get earthworms for fishing you know so that's our experience he doesn't want to farm at this point so i'm like all right i got to kind of do a work around here <laughs> um so we're kind of doing more of a natural approach to it um but yeah everything that they asked me why are you doing tillage well i had to think about it and if the answer was it's because that's the way dad does it. I knew that's the wrong answer, right? That's the wrong answer in life. As fast as things move and as fast as we're having an evolution, whether it's technology, whether it's learning, whether it's the environment, social concerns, farming, and I think we tend to think that we don't have to change, but we really have to change with the times. And I really like having to answer, I used to really dislike answering those why questions, um, but now I like it. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, whether it's, it's talking to my son and he says, why are you using chemicals? Well. I better have a good answer. You know, why are we doing that? Um, why are we using, you know, nitrogen? Why are we doing tillage? All those things. And what that's done is helped us really analyze and start to, to figure out new ways of doing things that might be a little bit outside the box. Um, and like I said, I think the, the same experience holds true with the environmental community. Um, I work with Shore Rivers. I'm on their board. Um, and they ask me all the time, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Well, over the last 10 years of working with them, it's really made me look at things and look at things a lot differently um, to at least ask the right questions that I was never asking before. I still don't know the answers, um, but knowing what questions to ask, I think, has really helped us change. So I'm going to go right into change. <laughs> Sorry. You, you get a turn. I know, I know, I know, I know. But this, is, this, is, <laughs> this has been since this, this conversation I had this morning on the way here. <clears throat> so this kind of throws this kind of throws my three points off kilter a little bit, but it's going to run right into what he's saying, what he said. So I had a conversation with uh, somebody from university personnel this morning, and and the conversation was, you, it's going to blow your mind when you see what such and such has done on on these tests that we're doing, huh? You mean to tell me that the last eighty years worth of research is now going to be thrown out the window because of? Possibly, this is all this is all speculative, because of new research that's come out or new technology. You know, we've been so stubborn for how many years? Because, well, that technology is what we've always used. Well, now we're finding that you know we've been so accepting of that technology that's 80 years old that the universities that came up with the university was you know they were the end all beat all right, and so why would we challenge that? Well, let's let's put our concentration on something else because they've already got that part figured out. Well, then somebody somebody that thinks outside the box finally said, well, "There's got to be a better way, or there's got to be something different." And you know, that's I I don't want to disclose any of what the research is or anything else, but it's just about thinking outside the box that you just got to do it. You know, it's it's amazing to watch that in our children, and and the questions they ask. Proceed. Sorry. <laughs> And then you have a point. I see it on my list. You're coming up next. <laughs> I thought these were random. So this yeah. is um, where I have ruminants in your system. So I get it. There's a lot of guys in here that the cows left the farm years ago, and the thought of even bringing them back into your operation is borderline, if not scary, for you. And I'm not saying this is the right fit for everybody or even that you need to have cows in your system. But we've gotten in such a, a two-crop monoculture here on the Delmarva where we're looking at corn, beans, because that's what the end user demands of us. 
And there, there's lots of other crops out there that we can utilize them, but a chicken can't utilize it. There's other animals out there that can. And ultimately, whether we're growing number two yellow corn or soybeans, we're in the protein market. We're all growing protein of some source. If it's chickens, if it's milk, if it's beef, ultimately most of those crops are going to go into proteins. And so how can you have a strategic relationship with someone else that you work with? Um, like I said, you don't have to be the one that has the cows, but is there someone out there that you can partner with, have a strategic relationship to allow you to broaden that crop, uh, crop base that you use um, and turn other crops that have been just cover crops, well now can they be a, a cash crop as well? Um, and that, that's where I see a lot of opportunity. All right, Jay. <laughs> so you guys see the same question or, or the same comment I see, so I don't have to repeat it. Um, so I brought props. I was the only person that brought props, so maybe I was out of line. But, you know, one of the best tools that anybody can have on their farm is, is pretty economical, and it's a shovel. Is uh, Phil King still in here? Phil King still in here? Oh, man, Phil King didn't stick around. <laughs> so the, the hardest thing to come by is time, right? But trying to manage it correctly is is where we all can be extremely wise. You know, Trey goes, walks around with a shovel because he's collecting earthworms because his kids like going fishing. You know, I, I could walk around for days and days with a shovel and next thing you know, I've, oh, wait a minute, I was supposed to go pick my kids up at school or something <laughs> like that. But it's, you know, there's so many, there's so many answers that are, that are just underneath the soil surface that you got to get a shovel out there and look at them. Um, I, I didn't really take this apart because I didn't want to destroy the, the, the texture of it and the, and the aggregates of it and things like that, but I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be worms in there. And so it's just kind of neat to, you get a little bit of it and you tear it apart and you see what this is doing and what that's doing. The majority of what's here is chickweed and henbit. Well, those are weeds, but they've held the structure together in the top layer of soil. Now there is, because I did, I specifically dug this shovel full because there's one single hairy vetch seed right there. And so it's going to be neat to be able to go back in a month and, and two months and three months and see how that vetch is, you know, changed itself into something of what it was. So um, don't be afraid to dig a hole in your ground. Don't use an excavator all the time. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of redundant. You got a lot of big holes to fill in. So just walk out there with a shovel and, and go down, you know, go down a shovel depth and just, just look at it and, and see what you got. You know, we've been able to figure out problems. I had a problem in a corn crop one time. And so I called, I called the, um, the, the crop consultant that I use, hey, I've got something going on with this corn crop. Well, come to find out, here's a mistake that I've made. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into making mistakes. So we're so no-till and cover crop for the last however many years, it gave me a false sense of security. I was out planting corn in the rain. We ended up having, you know, three quarters of an inch of rain that Saturday, but I was making great time. I kept right on planting. The planter was working fine. I was getting across the ground fine. But you know what? That planter, because it was so wet, I was making a compaction layer about two inches deep, which is right where I was planting that seed at two inches. Well, that corn started growing and it went that way. And we didn't know it. We couldn't figure out what was going on with this corn. It was spotty and it didn't look good, yellow and purple. and. So we dug it up and that, that we were watching the roots. They went down to that compaction layer that we created and they went sideways. And if I hadn't gone out there with a shovel, actually it took a, a guy that gets paid a lot more than I do to show up to me and tell me, well, all you need is a shovel. <laughs> and, and we went out there and dug it up and sure enough, that was our problem. So proceed with the chlorophyll. <laughs> all right, Chip, look to other indicators besides soil organic matter. <sighs> Mm. <laughs> on the spot. Uh, look, it's so organic matter. All right, I guess on the soil test, I think I was talking to Bill Rohr earlier about this. Um, they've started putting on there uh, the soil carbon, organic carbon on the soil test, and I kind of was questioning him on how you came up with a figure on the soil test um, because what I had learned yesterday and just to Lester, and that's why I'm still coming to these meetings. I'm retired, but I still don't want to stop learning um, because I have been excited for soil health for 20 years. 
anyway, and but he was telling me that um, it's just a mathematical figure that he's using on there that's roughly 57% of your organic. And what I learned yesterday was that if you could get your uh, organic matter up to five or six, um, then you would have 3% or better of carbon in your soil. Well, if 3% of carbon, I guess, is an iconic figure that makes everything in your soil be working great. So um, NP and K, I'll be honest, we don't do a whole lot for me anymore. Um, <laughs> um, I'm kind of got my soil and health condition that I kind of know what I want to put on it or not put on it anymore. I don't really listen to soil tests too much anymore. So Trey, use the equipment that works for you. Um, yeah, well, I'll start with, uh, I'll follow up on Jay's comment about the shovel. Um, that definitely works for us. I think one problem we had before was when we planted no-till, we always wanted to go to no-till. We were no-tilling, we've been no-tilling for 35 years, but in high yield conditions in corn, we couldn't get parity with conventional tillage. But the objective was whenever we did no-till is we wanted the field clean um, because it looked like it was the most consistent. It looked like it was the best seed bed. But what we found is that when we planted diverse um, cover crop mix and we let it grow, if you go out there with the shovel, the soil is actually much more consistent, even though it looks inconsistent from the eyes. You know, just driving by, you see the clover and the rape and the, the rye, and you would assume you can't plant through it because everything's uneven, there's different colors, and it looks, looks inconsistent. But when you dig into it with a shovel, where all those roots are intermeshed and where everything works together, you can see that it's actually much more consistent and a much better seed bed. It's more like, um, it's much more, much more closely resembles what a conventional seed bed would do because the reason conventional yields well is because everything's the same. You get the same emergence. So by using that shovel, um, we've done that. And then as far as, to get a little more technical and like the planters, um, for example, I was at a, a meeting this summer um, talking to three farmers that have been planting green forever. They're guys that I've learned from. And I'm just like, well, what kind of row cleaners do you use? And they all looked at me and went, you use row cleaners? I was like, yeah, of course you use row cleaners. So I think each farmer is a little different. Um, it kind of taught me a lesson. Um, we use row cleaners, but you really need to talk to somebody that's done it a little bit because there's some little nuance to it, like intertwined row cleaners that hit each other won't tangle up especially if you put a little scraper on the back. So sometimes it's very little things that if you dive into the field and your row cleaners tangle up the first time you move, you're gonna quit. You're never gonna plant green again. Um, but I think that planting green into no-till is easy, but you have to figure out what works. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be very expensive. Our planters are old, but we just keep adding attachments to them. So you don't need to have the, the latest and greatest. You don't have to have Delta Force. You don't have to have all these you know, fancy things, they help. Um, but a lot of it's just a matter of having the row cleaner, the disc opener, and just the, the basic fundamentals of it. Um, so it's just a matter of each farmer finding their own comfort zone and what works for them, but uh, that's what works for us. On that equipment, everybody is getting hung up about planting green. What do you got to do to your equipment? When I first started, I started in soybeans with a 455 drill, conventional drill. It went through it like cutting butter. Um, there's a lot. The ground is mellower and it plants better green than it does no-till. Um, and corn, I, I don't use any row cleaners, never did, and it <laughs> made out great. Uh, so it, you know, there's not a lot you have to do to some equipment to make it work right. All right, Matt, don't be afraid to try something because your neighbor may see that it didn't work. Yeah, as being the organic guy up here, that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty used, you know, you, you get kind of humble on that quick because if you're worried about what your neighbor thinks, you're, that ship sailed, sailed for you. Um, you know, for us, and this goes back to some of the things I said earlier, we've got a resilient system in that we've got uses for crops. Even if it's a quote unquote fail, we've got an economic use for that crop. And so we're willing to take some risks that maybe uh, if you're just hauling corn into the elevator, you, you can't take that same risk. But for us, where we harvest, most of our crops get harvested as whole crop forages. Um, we've got a little bit of leeway there. Um, not to say that that doesn't impact our feed cost or, or drive up our cost of production if it's not successful, but you just can't worry about what your neighbors are doing um, because they're, they're gonna look at you sometimes and scratch your head and you just, kind of got to keep down and keep going. If you've got an end goal in mind of where you want to be, that's what you need to focus on. 
Chip, back to you. Doing your research, the solution to a problem may be found outside your local area. Well, most everything I've ever done, I've pretty well found outside my area. Um, these guys weren't in existence when I was around, <laughs> most of them. But <laughs> anyway, um, I went to a lot of meetings like you're going to today. Um, I've traveled all over to go to meetings, um, and this is where I've picked up most of my information from is i got, you know, you'll go to a meeting, a local meeting, and you'll pick up one thing from, say, Jay, and another meeting, you'll pick up something from Matt or from Trey or whatever. I mean, you pick up little things at meetings all along, um, and you just filter all that stuff in and make it work in your operation. So. All right, Jay, it is not selfish to put your bottom line first. So it's, it's been really nice to have have some of the speakers we've had in the last day and a half, last 24 hours, because it's finally talked about is your bottom line. I mean, let's face it, we can do all the experimenting we want. We can have all these crazy wild ideas of what we want to do to help fix this or make it better for that or, or whatever. But at the end of the day, if, if we're not an economical, if we're not, if we're not turning a profit, we're going broke. And, and what good, what good is it, <clears throat> For me to pass down to the next generation, for me to pass down to my kids, what good is it for me to pass down uh, a, a business entity that that's broke? It, it doesn't it doesn't work. You know, um, I'm I'm blessed enough in in knowing you know my father and my uncle, and and blessed enough to to be able to have done business with them alongside of them along with my grandfather, and to give them honor in saying that you know I was handed a business that was profitable I was handed a, a legacy that was profitable uh, we don't just talk about our business we want to talk about our legacies right so uh, you know knowing that I have the opportunity to do that to my children you know I didn't say it in when I when I was speaking because you guys hopefully already read the bio or whatever it doesn't matter but you know my sister's back there in the corner you know she's got kids of her own so I've got the responsibility also to make sure that even her kids have have a legacy that's that's profitable that's viable and that they can make the decisions they need to make into the future so guys at the end of the day you've got to put a pencil to it and figure out what's profitable and what's not new technology it's great it's fun is it worth it i don't know you know thankfully the universities are starting to pick some of this stuff apart to know whether some of these latest and greatest ideas and technology and planner attachments and tillage attachments and all of this whether it actually does pay off in the long run or whether it's just some cool new technology that we want to be the the, the coolest kid in town well that that's that's a good way to end up having to work for somebody else next year so we've got to be real, real careful in that regard, especially, you know, I think in our generation, we kind of walked into something that was pretty easy to make money at. And things are, things are kind of realigning themselves. We've got to be, you know, we've got to relook at some stuff and, you know, Chip, to pick at your age a little bit and, and your generation that's in the room, you guys lived through the 80s and understood what all that mess was about. You know, I walked into something that was, you know, $8 corn and $14 soybeans. You know, you could really mess up a lot of stuff. So, Trey, look at opportunities for future financial viability. Well, um, I don't know if it's right. What, well, one thing we're doing is uh, starting to sell carbon credits. And what that's done is opened up my eyes to what might be available in the future. Um, you know, we've had premiums for organic and we've had pre premiums in the farmer's markets. Um, which I think have all been great for agriculture, but I think if we can start to change the conversation about farming and agriculture and make it more of a positive, you know, if it's fixing climate change, then that's great. And if we can do that by developing markets where we can then sell those carbon credits, I think that makes it even better, right? So you can take the no-till cover crop scenario, sequester a ton of carbon, sell that, sell that credit, so not only do we get money and a little bit better economic viability for the farm by getting the money for that carbon credit, but it's also got a whole different group of folks. You know, in this case, I've got a, a, a startup from Seattle that is supporting what I do. You know, they like my farm. They like what I'm doing. So it's getting my voice as a farmer rather than, than talking to and, 
and hanging out with a bunch of farmers, I've actually got a group that's non-farm. Um, you know, I draw back on, um, you know, kind of a reputation. I mean, you look at the comments from like Mike Bloomberg recently, you know, was that, was that his fault or was that our fault, right? You know, I mean, why wasn't he educated? Why wasn't he reading stories about farmers in the Wall Street Journal? You know, if he had, he would know how complex our operations were. But whose fault is it that we weren't in the Wall Street Journal over the last 10 years? You know, I mean, I think that it's it, not saying what he said was right, but I think it's time to reflect a little bit as well. So if we can get into things that are other markets, maybe it's not just producing number two yellow corn. Maybe it's a number two yellow corn that has a carbon footprint on it. Maybe it's worth a premium in the grocery store. Maybe we could sell Matt's milk with his name on the carton that says this came from Matt's farm. I'd feel better buying it. Right? I'd probably pay a couple more cents if I saw he and his family on it and where it went from. Or, you know, I mean, I, I just think that with the technology we have today, I think that the, the future of financials and getting out of commoditized crops, I think there's potential, um, particularly as it, it pertains to the environment and the way we grow our crops. I'd like to build on what Trey's talking about, this, this concept of carbon sequestration. This is going to be a really big deal to the end user. Uh, we have a direct m relationship with our milk buyer, and, and this is coming down the track. You know, consumers want to know where their food comes from, how it was produced, what's the impact to the environment. And there's a lot of big ag and big companies out there making big promises to the consumer and ultimately it's going to be about who can deliver these promises and how are they going to do it. And they want to be able, be able to tie that right back to your farm. Um, so this is something that if it's not something you're thinking about or looking at now, uh, it's something you should be looking at because it's coming and it's coming faster than a lot of us are going to be ready for it. And to add to that, I think if we can jump out in front of it as, a, as an agricultural industry, if we can start to make markets that pay for us rather than waiting five years and then having the market mandate us and not pay for it, to me the proceeding seems better. You know, so if we can get out there, embrace climate change, embrace carbon sequestration, embrace the consumers and the social concerns that we have, we've been known to not do in the past, get our voices out there, then hopefully the farmer gets the profit as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the larger corporations. We, you know, maybe we can get a little bigger percentage of that piece of the pie. I got. I hope it works out this time with a carbon sequestration and selling carbon credits. We tried this, Keith, what's it been, 20 years, 20 years. ago, climate change, mm -hmm. Keith, uh, something like that, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, we, all, we went through the same thing that, and we all signed up for carbon credits and hopefully make things a lot better and it just, it just kind of died. I don't know what happened to it, to be honest with you. But I just hope it's not a recycle and it's just going through its phase again. Right. Cover crops used to be a thing in Sussex County, Delaware. Right? Anybody know that? Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so cover crops used to be a thing in Sussex County, Delaware. That's just a fact. But when did they go away? And so I started drilling my grandfather. We got into this cover crop thing and this, this plant and green thing and this no-till thing. No-till is something new. We're not going to go there at the moment. But cover crops is not new. And those of you who have heard me speak before have heard me make reference to a little teeny tiny spreader that's about this big, about this tall, holds maybe a bushel. And my grandfather had that on a Farmall A. It was a battery powered, a six volt spreader that he put on a Farmall A. And he would ride through a cornfield when he could still get across that corn and spread cover crop. And his cover crop of choice then, and it's his, it's, it's his fault that I had to start doing it again after my first year of failure with uh, ryegrass. He said, you gotta, you gotta try this ryegrass. He said, we used to grow it. He said, and I swear you hook a chain to it and pull the world up because of the root system this stuff had. And well, pop up, why, why did you go away from cover crops? If this is like this new fad, right? Because in my generation, this is something new. But they were doing it in the 30s and 40s. Well, what happened was what was referred to today as the chemical manufacture of synthetic fertilizers. I don't know how much I'm being recorded here, but maybe I'll go off the record to say we got a little lazy. But maybe we got more efficient. 
I guess would be a better way of saying it. We had to find other things to do with our time that, that made us profitable. And at the time, in that generation, they found that higher yields was king and that being economically efficient was the way to go. But now we're finding that fertilizers cost a lot more and we don't want to be wasteful and we're trying to keep it out of where it doesn't belong. And this generation, and I don't want to pick on, you know, I, I say this generation, meaning this era of farmers. So the farmers that are farming now for the last 30 years are being extremely efficient of capturing every bit of nutrient that they put on their field, that it's not ending up where it doesn't belong. And I'm real proud to be able to say that, and we had the facts to back that up. So that, I guess, in itself is kind of where, you know, where, where that kind of stems from. Don't be afraid to ask what you're doing and to look into history as to well, why was it done then and it's not done now, but we're going to go back and do it again. And it's just interesting to watch history kind of repeat itself um, on some very healthy and, and profitable ideas. Recognize that organizations want farmers to have a seat at the table. Yeah, I guess I touched on this a little earlier, um, but to me, 20 years ago, it was very foreign to have farmers cooperating with environmental organizations. I mean, it dates all the way back to the Pasteria outbreak in the mid-90s, where the Chesapeake Bay Foundation first started to, um, I'm not going to say first started, first started to work with me as a farmer um, and kind of learn where each other was coming from. And what we learned through that experience and then the evolution over the last 20 years is that um, what I've learned is by going back to my being uncomfortable is by joining these organizations and going in areas where I thought that I was disliked, even though I wasn't, it was just a false, mis it was a false perception, right? Um, that the folks at the table that, that I thought were anti-farming were pro-water quality and pro-environment, but they weren't anti-farming, they were just trying to come up with solutions to problems. Um, so it's been a very, at least where we are on the northern eastern shore, um, a very collaborative thing. I know, uh, Matt, you've worked with them on projects. I've worked with them on projects. Um, we've gotten technology put onto farms. We've gotten big uh, water restoration projects done. Now we're doing some tile drainage. I mean, it's really been quite exciting for me, but it's also opened my eyes um, and really changed the way I farm um, in a lot of ways because it's been folks that don't know as much about farming, but know more about the environment. So the questions that I start to ask myself become different. Um, so it kind of ties back into a couple of those conversations. But I definitely was very welcomed, um, which surprised me. And I've had that lesson taught to me several times over the last 15 years, is that by being involved, by having a voice at the table, um, it's a lot better than, than just ignoring the fact, locking the, the farm gate, not doing the research. Um, we've got Ray Weil here. He's been doing research on my farm for five years on a grant funded by Shore Rivers. You know, I never thought I would have been comfortable with not only obtaining data on the farm, but then also having it be shared data. But now we're able to learn from that data. But I also know, more importantly, that the data is good, right? The data is not biased data contracted through someone that was paying money for this, that, or the other. This is work that's done on my farm by university, funded by the, uh, by the environmental community. So the environmental community also knows that it's good data, right? It's not just one side, you know, it seems like we have such a, a weird science going on now where it becomes almost politicized and this is kind of both sides working together, come up with good solutions. Um, but I will say that it surprised me how welcoming everyone was uh, to the farm and how willing everyone was to want to learn about farming, what we do and how we do it. Don't look at failure as a setback, look at it as a learning experience. Yeah, I've had more failures than probably most people in this whole room. Um, but I was never, I don't know why, but I was never, ever afraid to try anything. Um, I was probably one of the first ones in our area ever to try anything. Um, people would say, my, my farm is on a road that's no traffic, but I'm telling you, I've had much traffic at times. <laughs> but um, I'm going to touch base on the rye deal. I was, I was a young person then. Um, we used to mow board rye in, uh, in the 60s, in uh, early 60s. And uh, I can tell you, if rye gets away from you, you try to mow board plow it, that's the last field you ever want to see of it. Um, so <laughs> that was a learned experience. Thank goodness my father, his, my uncles, soon changed to chisel plowing, and, and that really ended the rye. Uh, 
they couldn't handle rye and chisel plow. So uh, that was an early learning experience. But on the cover crop end, I guess when I first started, um, of course I was listening to people away from here on how to plan it, what to do. Anyway, I was planting radishes for the first time. And that was, actually it was the first year. And I planted them in the soybeans with an airplane. And they told me, wait till the leaves turn yellow and go ahead and have the airplane put it on. Fine, that's what I did. But they didn't tell me that it was gonna rain for a month and you'd be late getting harvest. Well, when I went in to harvest soybeans, I had radishes that tall. Well, I got rid of my combine that year and got a new one. But anyway, <laughs> it, was, it was a mess. I just couldn't get through it. Uh, the beans were dry. Anyway, they ended up being 19 percent, and they should be 13 for the people that don't know, but um, they were 19 percent because of all the moisture from the radishes in my tank, grain tank, looked, it was completely green. It was, it was just a mess. So, I mean, I've never been afraid to make mistakes, but I don't make them a second time. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, soil health is an ongoing process. We don't ever reach the finish line. Yeah, I think that's been clear from the speakers we've listened to this morning that you know there's there's always room for improvement in what we're doing uh there's changes in science changes in technology um and it's about knowing that we're chasing that goal but that we're never going to reach there but that's part of the, that's part of the fun you know we don't have to cross that finish line for it to be a success as long as we're continuing to to strive after that we can still be successful that was our last one, and I think we have a little more than 10 minutes for questions. So, um, I haven't had any issues. I don't have any issues in corn. Um, in soybeans, we have some issues. In corn, we're using, um, we're going in with either paraquat and glyphosate or glyphosate mixed with Lexar, which is atrazine, metallochlor, mesotrione. Um, we've dropped our rates back from six pints to four pints, um, and we're still getting good termination of that rapeseed. In beans, we've had some issues. Uh, the residuals that we're combining with our glyphosate, we're using glyphosate, glufosinate, plus some, a residual package in our beans because we have so much uh, glyphosate resistance. Um, and we've had a few years where they come back. Um, I have one field uh, that's non-GMO, and I can't spray glyphosate on it at all. Um, it's per the landowner. She's against GMOs and glyphosate, but I can use other chemistry, and that's probably been our biggest mess. Um, we did get a lot of rapeseed come back. It smelled like cabbage when we cut the beans, and I think it did hurt my yield some uh, because they came back and were it came back and were were competitive. Uh, in the GMO beans, um, we've had to do some respray with just glyphosate, but once it's been stunted, if it starts to come back, we've gotten pretty easy control um, with that second application. How, how much um, of a component of your beans is it? We go with a couple pounds. I mean, honestly, I like it because it's pretty. Um, for lack of a better reason, um, it, it's beautiful. We try to, you know, we're kind of concentrating on uh, a lot of our focus has been on the environment, and part of that includes the biology around our fields. Um, so, with all the focus on pollinators and killing pollinators as a farmer, it's a big concern of ours. So, the question then becomes how do we offset what we're doing? If we are doing damage, let's figure out what, what's going on with the neonicotinoids, but let's also provide habitat. So that early flowering rapeseed, we learned that when we're out in the fields, we grew some rape for Purdue a few years ago. We're not currently growing it, but what we learned is there's a tremendous number of bees out there. Um, so by putting a couple pounds of rape out there, one, we're adding diversity to our soil. We're seeing a lot of mycorrhizal fungi in that root group. When we pull it up, like if you pull it up now, you can see it. Um, and then what that's also doing is allowing us to have flowering plants up until the day of, of planting. Then we'll terminate it with chemistry so that habitat gets taken down, but we've pulled out all our insecticides that would have killed bees. So that, that's part of it. I like riding down the road and, and seeing the pretty flowers. Um, it's now with, that, with that stem on rape, if, that would, if you crimped it, that would terminate it, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that break it? We've tried crimping it. Um, we do a lot of crimping, um, but the, we haven't had a whole lot of luck with rape. Um, it'll stun it enough that it doesn't go to seed, and it depends. I like fields clean, so seeing something out there as a scraggler, is a little uncomfortable just because it's not clean. I'm trying to get more accustomed to, to accepting that, whether it's growing legumes with our corn as complementary crops and trying to figure out how to do some relay cropping stuff, um, but still struggling. As much as I, I struggled with getting my mind wrapped around planting green, I'm struggling with my brain to get 
used to seeing rapeseed out growing in my bean field and not being, knowing that it's probably not affecting yield, but it just doesn't, it, it's that, you know, the farmer circle. <laughs> I shouldn't care what my neighbors think, but I'm when judging. you got a field that's a mess, <laughs> his dad will be calling me, Trey, have you seen that field next to us? Yeah, yeah I've seen it. You've got pretty flowers. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that stuff's, but I think the pretty flowers are part of farming, right? You know, if we're going to be at environmental stewards, if we're going to be socially out there and start to tell our stories and get it out there, it starts, every single person's got to start on one field. You know, and if that's me having flowers on Route 20, which is the main thoroughfare of our county, then yeah, I'll do it. You know, and if it's a couple bucks an acre, it's not that expensive. It's building some diversity in our soil. I'm going to learn from it. Why not do it? Um, but yeah, the, the control can become an issue. Not every farmer is as innovative as you four. If you were designing a program, incentives, or outreach to try and get more farmers to do what you're doing, what would you do? I'd stick with the money, right? I mean, that's how you learn. Um, Maryland's cover crop program this year is giving an extra $10 to go to May 1st. Um, I know we're in Delaware, but um, Hans Schmidt said last week it sold out. You know, as much as they, they, they put an acreage cap on it so that you could only sign up so many acres. And what's that going to do? It's going to make farmers plant green. It's going to force them to get out of their comfort zone. Times are tight. Jay talked about that. Markets are down again today. Who knows what's going to happen over the next, you know, month with corona. Um, you know, $10 is a lot of money to me uh, per acre. Um, so the cover crop programs work and make them easy and flexible. Um, no, I would agree with that. You know, Maryland and, and Delaware, too, their cover crop programs have been very successful relative to the rest of the country because there's been a financial incentive there. And ultimately, uh, the guys around this room, not just us, but everybody's in business. Um, and the only way we're, we stay in business and be sustainable is if we're profitable. So that's, that's a strong place to start. And I would say that if you went to a high-yield farming conference, the conversation would be very different than what we're getting here, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, it, it does. It comes down to bottom line. And so we've had the examples today of showing, you know, profitability when you include these practices. And so it really does come down to public outreach. Um, and it, you know, it's going along what you're all saying, it would also be nice to bring the environmentalist group to the table. You know, instead of coming up with a lawsuit against the family because they had something that resembled a manure pile sitting in their field, well, why not, you know, throw that money at a cover crop program? You know, wh why do we not have every single acre on Delmarva in cover crop? I mean, that's a question for us to ask you all. Help us to understand why. You know, I, the only reason my farm is not 100% cover crops is because I run out of time. That seed right there was planted in December. Well, that was after any window of, of payment. It's because I know it's profitable. And, you know, that right there is going to help next year's sweet corn crop. I don't put as much fertilizer on it. You know, we're, we're gearing up. As soon as it dries out enough, we can get across the field with a planter. I've got a 15-inch planter. Uh, I don't remember who was that, that displayed that, yeah, we can cut our seeding rate way back when we use an actual singulating corn planter to plant different types of seed. And so it's, it's ready to go as soon as, as soon as it dries out enough we can get across the field. And so, you know, llama beans are going in there, field corn is going in there, things that are going to use that, that nitrogen, that legume, and that's way, I mean, that's way beyond the window. I mean, we're going to be planting within two months of when the termination date is. And before the program, I was, when the program first came out, I thought it was a waste of money. I mean, I didn't think cover crops did anything because I thought we were farming well and I didn't, didn't have any research. You know, I thought the research that had been done was from the other side, you know, forcing it upon us, but I figured I better learn how to do it. Um, so I think the programs do work. Um, it probably took me 20 years, which shows that I'm probably not, not that bright, but um, it, it took a long time, but it, it convinced me that it does work. So now it, I, I would say in absence of the program or changes to the program, I would still cover crop, um, but it's getting folks out there and getting them comfortable with it. Um, 
is a big difference. And if your farm's running successfully and you're not cover cropping and you're not no-till, it's very difficult to change. You know, if you're making money, you're working with your father, you've got that battle going on, you've got, you know, family <laughs> legacy, you've got your team to, to get bought into. I mean, it's a lot of work and a lot of stress to implement this. Um, and a lot of people that are going to, you, your neighbors are talking about you. Um, you know, it's a lot, to, it's a lot going on um, to do it. So it, it takes time. Um, and if you're running a successful operation, it's very difficult to change because why are you going to change what works? So went to a wedding on uh, Saturday and the lady at the table sitting with my wife and I, she found out that we were a farmer and, and she said to me, well, here's what I don't understand. How come, how come all this land's being bought up and turned into developments on the eastern side of Sussex County? And it's, guys, we're in Sussex County, those of you who don't know, and, you know, 113 is right out there, and that side is considered eastern Sussex County. And, well, our home farm is just on that side of 113, but we also have some on this side that's neither here nor there. But how come, how come all this land's being bought up and, you know, farmers are just getting out? Well, because they're, you know... They're, they're A, they're, they're, they've got no, no next generation that's interested, or B, they're seeing dollar signs because they can, you know, they can liquidate an asset in a, in a big hurry and, and live in a way in which they want to. So let's have that conversation, right? If, if you don't want to see land in your neighborhood get developed, how much are you willing to pay as the consumer to, to me, the farmer, in something in, lar in regards to environmental stewardship, to, to have a win-win, to keep me viable, to keep the next generation viable, that we want to stay here. You know, I, I, would, I would venture to say that the majority of farmers don't want to cash out because we're still having fun. You know, Chip's up here because he's having fun. You know, he didn't sell out. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the thing is as long as, as long as we can stay profitable and stay viable and still have fun, then we're going to stay here. So we need the public's help in some of that stuff as well. It's about time. We have time maybe for one more quick question. I just have a comment to follow up on the uh, gentleman's question there about support for farmers in these programs. So health and social quality. Well, if you don't participate in these programs, they won't be there in the future. Every every funding cycle, after every year, they look at what was you know, what farmers were asking for, and the uh, state and the federal government will allocate that money where they think it's needed. If you don't want to participate in the programs, well, they won't fund it because they won't see a need to. They'll allocate it somewhere else. Case in point, last fall, I was talking to my father law and said, I want to try something uh, on a small piece of ground. It's 50 acres to 2,000, so it's relatively small or organic. I wanted to add to, uh, different uh, cover crop to uh, mixes, to the corn and soybean mix, do some minimum till, and Bill wanted to see if there was any uh, cost out there, so we both went in the office. And it looked a little questionable at first, and we walked away, you know, letting, we left uh, the DC uh, and, uh, and the office folk you know, look at it, and lo and behold, Chris Brown right here in Maryland, the state office found a way to make it work for us. And, you know, those programs are there, but you gotta use them. If you don't use them, they're going to go away. So they're going to go away because well, won't be a need to allocate the money for them. So I to, that's going to be. I think it's going to be a great experience for us to see how this works out in our system, and we're going to learn from it. And that's that's the whole goal. But it wouldn't be there if it weren't for people like Christine and the state office folks and uh, soil conservation at those levels um, throughout the state and Fed. So, but the programs are there. It's just you've got to you got to look into it. You got to participate. You got to talk to somebody. Somebody's there to help you, and they'll get you. They'll, you'll, you'll figure out something for you. There's a workaround because sometimes the paperwork is a mess, but that's what they're there for. Figured out. That's what they did for us. I'll remember that. They're working for me, and I'm grateful. Well, I want to say thank you to our panelists. We appreciate the everything that you've shared here in the last hour very much.